All right, so Ronda Rousey, she has a book out, and I think I touched on it. Um, I forgot the name of the book. But anyway, she got a book out. And she's on a whirlwind tour promoting her book. Okay? And in the midst of all of this, her memoir, Our Fight. Excuse me, there we go. I want to be at least a little bit respectful. In the midst of her promoting her book and everything, and that's fine, Rhonda is like CM Punk and like all the other people who have experienced WWE and have their experiences with different wrestling promotions and different things that happen in their life. She's telling her story. But see, the difference between Rhonda and CM Punk, um, CM Punk in the beginning was very angry you know, clouded, whatever the case may be. Right now, he's in a cloud of craziness because Tony Khan can't let go. But CM Punk was on Ariel Hawani, and his interview was like, it's like night and day to Ronda's. Because CM Punk comes off as genuine. It's like, this is me, take me as I am. This I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. Maybe it's because he's from Chicago. I'm from New York. Which is funny because the thing he did in the video where he was like, <laughs> y'all better get this motherfucker. I completely understand. Like, I'm only going to do but so much talking before I said it on you. So Ronda's in two podcast one with steve-o and then there's this other podcast called the diary of a ceo and it's british like i cannot stand the british accent but for some reason the british people are dominating a lot of wrestling content so if you can point me in the direction of the americans that would be nice um the podcast with the CEO guy is an uh, hour and 33 minutes. And the podcast with, um, what is this guy? Steve-O is also about an hour and uh, 30 minutes. Night and day. The one she did with the guy, it elicits some type of sympathy. I appreciate this fella for putting um, time stamps on his stuff because I could just get to what I want to know because I really like I'm not really trying to get all in the woods with her because I kind of know what she's talking about from listening to a few other podcasts and everything like that um she starts off in the I am uh CEO podcast she was born with a rare disease called aproxia the disease is basically when she's trying to talk, her mind's telling her to say one thing, but she's saying something else. It's a lot of stuttering. It's a lot of impairment. She says a proxy. Some people would call it a speech impediment. Whatever. Um, she Her struggles as a child. Her father killed himself, I believe. Finding out about the suicide. Rhonda's mother was very hard on her. She was a fighter. She wants her daughter to be a fighter. An independent woman. Um... All of that was ingrained in her as a kid. She's very comp uh, competitive. She became a judo prodigy. Uh, she moved in with her coach at 16. She said the coach, a lot of people don't know that the coach, I think she said in this podcast or other podcasts, the coach injured her. Um, she struggled with bulimia. Not uncommon for girls in sports. There's a certain type of body that they want. We have other wrestlers who struggle with bulimia, anorexia, Alexa Bliss, Bianca Belair, to name a few. I'm pretty sure there's more. What else? She got bullied about her physique. Not uncommon in the world of sports. Oh, my God. Anybody could relate to that, baby. We could look at someone like Bianca Belair. Somebody like uh, uh, Jay Cargill. Um, someone like Charlotte. Even I say Charlotte don't got no hips. Bullied for their physique because it's not buxom and big. Now those NXT girls that's coming in, now they got some asses on them. Now we'll see how that works with all that trunk they pulling. Um, Ronda competed in the Beijing Olympics. Lack of pay. Uh, 
dark side becomes the driver of success. She she goes over her concussions. The, she talks about how she you know she's in her cocky stage. She defeated people in sixty seconds. She was uh, here. She again talks about very strict abusive coaches. She said, uh, like I said, she got uh, injured by her coaches. The relationship you had with Edmund, and it wasn't always great in terms of his approach to coaching. You talk about how he would physically strike you during training, but more, potentially even more severely, he would emotionally abuse you during training. I mean, honestly, I can't think of a single coach that I had, like, a great like a like a great relationship with like this is like a lot of the coaches were of that like Bella Crowley kind of generation of like they thought that being abusive to the athletes is what gave them the best results and that was kind of what was like in vogue at the time so and to her um credit if you don't know who Bella Crowley is he's a famous gymnastics coach uh, Nadia Comaneci, Dominique Dawes, uh, that one girl who's dying of cancer. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Got the bowl cut from the 70s and the 80s, real popular. Um, they all came up under Bella Caroli. He was whooping their ass. He was whooping their ass. And a lot of people look past coaches because of homophobia for the males. Um, toughen up the girls to get them where they need to be and a lot of society says that this is proper this is how you make people better people by essentially abusing them emotional and physically I think coaches have uh, entirely too much power over children and uh, people that they are putting put in positions of power over young and impressionable minds that's how you got the penn state ohio state um the whole gymnastics explosion and stuff like that is because coaches living vicariously and going into business themselves and injuring and damaging young lives in the process um she went on to talk about how that uh abuse from her coaches impacted her going forth she talked about how you know she suppressed her emotions um she discussed what Dana White, his impact in her life. Why was she fighting so frequently? She said because she liked it. Being the first woman to appear on UFC, she talked about. The new Jackie Chan um, moniker, Rhonda and Holly Holm. I'm not really going to go into that because essentially it's a lot of excuse making. I know she said she came in with a concussion because she fell down the stairs. And she went into the fight concussed. So she didn't know what was going on. And she'd been concussed since she was 12. Um, her last fight in UFC, which we talked about before um, in the previous podcast, where she essentially people celebrated her demise. That was very triggering for her. She wanted to kill herself. She goes on about her husband, how wonderful and beautiful he is. Then she discusses the WWE. She talks about social media and how they work her nerves. Stuff would get to you. I mean, you know, starts off like that. <laughs> but yeah, um, at first, you know, um, when everything was going great, it was like I would look at my comments like the morning newspaper. I'd wake up in the morning and look at my comments. I'd look at my tag photos. And it's so unhealthy. <laughs> but... Um, but after my first loss, I quit cold turkey, which I feel like that was one thing that I needed to do was to like not constantly need to that um, outside validation and stuff like that, especially from the internet and social media and stuff. And I was kind of like spiraling in a way. So everything was going good. It was fueling her. People was singing her praises when everything ain't good. People going to kick you down. They're going to kick you square in your vagina, which is what they were doing. So let's just be honest. And so she just cut it all out. A lot of people need to do that. She went on to say, did she feel expendable in the WWE? To the WWE? Yes. Yeah. I think we, you all, we all did. All we were, and they, they made sure to make us feel that way. Why? Well, they, they made sure to make you feel that way? Yeah. So that you wouldn't get above your station or something? Or so that you would yeah. just do whatever you're told? Yeah, just do whatever you're told. Just take it. 
And you're all contractors at the, at the WWE as well, so you're not employees. You have to pay for your own health care and all these kinds of things from what I read in your book. Yep. Which is pretty crazy. I mean, that, that would never be allowed in uh, where I'm from. In the and then he had to say, you know, the UK, listen, we understand the lore of WWE and under Vince McMahon. Hence, AEW was supposed to have health care, have a union, have all this type of shit. None of that's happening, but we'll talk about that later. Um, Vince and all of the biz, biz, big businessmen find loopholes to their employees. If WWE had employees, quote-unquote, they would have to provide health care. They would have to provide things that unions have fought for but because they have them under contract they have to pay for everything so it's important that you come in making millions because you have to pay for your health care i believe if you injured in the ring they cover it if you're injured outside the ring that's on you you have to pay for your flights your food your hotel everything is covered on you i don't even think you get like a bonus if you become a champion and they pay for it she felt expendable. I don't know how I feel about that too much. I could give my opinion on it. When Rhonda first came in, she was top priority. She was the taste of the month, I should say. She was the brand new toy. Triple H, Stephanie McMahon, Kurt Angle, they cushioned her. Everybody surrounded Rhonda in 2018. They gave her all of the protection and the cushion she needed for that year to be so successful that something inside of Rhonda said, I could do this again. And I may could be doing I may could do this without anybody to prop me up. And we see she could not do it. It could not be done. I think that is where Rhonda's ego and self esteem got slammed. You need people around you. When we talk about somebody like Jay Cargill, she fresh. If everybody surrounded Jay, did not surround Jay Cargill and stuff, she probably would be showing terribly in a new world that's WWE. Because WWE is a whole, they got their own thing. It's like working at Burger King. Now you work at McDonald's. We don't flip burgers like Burger King. We flip them like McDonald's. I think she got ahead of herself. I think she thought, oh, well, this is just wrestling. Ain't that fucking serious. You know, they love me over here. I can, I can have kids. I can chill and shit. And then after that first year and the women's evolution and the high and everybody was turned on and woo, once that shit wore down, they was like, bitch, you finna work. I don't give a fuck about none of what you talking about. You signed this contract. We about to get every last dime out your bitch ass. And that's exactly what they did. She thought, because she was Rhonda, she had friends. And she learned real fast that the WWE ain't no different than any other place that is going to use a product until they can't use them no motherfucking more. So she went on to, we already know she talked about Vince McMahon. Yes, and I'm not mad about her running him down. He did shit on the girl and tried to pay her off. And whoop de whoop de whoop. If you want to get into that, I did the I read the whole entire um all the facts are right there for you. I read the whole charges up there. So there won't be no confusion. Um she went on to talk about suffering two miscarriages. Again, Rhonda confused herself and continued to wrestle and continue to be active. And in the midst of all that lost her well, lost uh, pregnancies. Then she went on to talk about IVF. Which, listen, IVF ain't nothing to play with. People who have to do that, I take my hats off to them. The women who have to go through it. Because it's the women that got to do it. The women got to take the needle. Got to go get their ovaries. Got to do all this. All the men do is extract the sperm. You go bust in a can and give it to the woman. She got to literally, I mean, go through the motion. Not only that to her body but the psychological abuse that both both as long as both are invested in having a child the psychological abuse that comes with it um i also like that this guy said it's not, because he's also doing ivs he said it's not just the woman what thought what fails for society fails to realize it it takes two people to have a healthy child if your sperm ain't no good 
it's a higher possibility of disabilities. It's a higher possibility of wrinkled children. It's a higher possibility of behavior issues. If the sperm ain't no good. If the egg ain't no good, you already know what's going what's what's about to go down. But everything's put on the woman. She yes, yeah, she has to hold the baby and make it grow. But all outside influences will make that baby go through so much that they'll come out inside out sometimes. I see babies born inside out. Guts and everything on the outside. And don't nobody can tell you why. I really felt for her there because she wants her children. She wants kids. She did have one while she was in the WWE. She wants more. And as you get older, let me tell y'all something real quick. Age don't got shit to do with nothing. They call a woman who is in her 30s a geriatric pregnancy. Biologically, a woman in her 30s is the most fertile she will ever be. Sometimes a little bit past their 40s. But when you exercise and you doing all this hardcore stuff and you adding all types of things to your body to optimize, it that slows down your fertility. So they some people say go ahead and get the eggs and stuff out and freeze them so when you're ready you can have them. But then what we find is, is your body able to hold the pregnancy? We could get the we could get the egg fertilized and stuff in the petri dish. Now we got to see if your body can get that egg to lock into that those walls of the womb and that placenta wrap around it. That way you can get, hold the pregnancy. That's where people are failing to realize where the miscarriage is coming from. So she's going through that. Did her traumas make her make her who she she was? Where did she get happiness? What has she learned from her dad? All of that. This was a very good. Um, this was a very good uh, interview with the diary of the CEO. If you want Rhonda from a more uh, sensitive, vulnerable spot where you could empathize with her, that's the one you need to watch. The next one I'm talking about. Is probably not doing Rhonda any favors. Now, real quick, this one, the diary of the CEO's interview got 432,000 views. Now, Steve O's interview got 44,000 views, but for some reason, the stuff she's saying in Steve O's interview is getting more traction. If you like this, tell me what you think in the comments. Hit me back. Meet me on the next one.